16 year old has been killed after an argument over McDonald's sweet and sour sauce. On the 27th of August, police responded to a call of a 16 year old girl being treated in hospital for stab wounds. The teenager Naima Ligon from Maryland then sadly passed away from her injuries. It's believed that the fatal stabbing took place outside of a McDonald's in Washington, D.C. A detective announced that the stabbing occurred after a dispute over sweet and sour sauce between three girls outside of the restaurant. It's believed that they were all part of a group that had been to a party previously. Naima and another girl had apparently been assaulting the other teenager first and she didn't appear to fight back. However, when the pair tried to get into a vehicle, it's believed that the other girl came at Naima with a knife. The girl was charged with second degree murder and they have found the murder weapon. What was for girl dinner in the Victorian era? This segment is brought to you by the Ugly Girl Papers, which was the standard for feminine beauty in the Victorian era. And its advice is chaos. The first advice that the book gives is for weight loss. And while I'm telling you about this, I'm not endorsing it. So breakfast is going to be a small saucer of strawberries and one graham cracker. Lunch is just a half of an orange because a lady can't be burdened with the other half. And dinner is a bowl of cherries. According to this book, this diet was enough to calm the pesky feminine nerves, never make you hungry, and promote weight loss. But they have some more advice if you're a girly with a bad stomach. Women with bad stomachs were encouraged to add one cup of beef tea per day. The book says that adding one cup of what's essentially bone broth would give you the same amount of strength as eating three-fourths of a pound of beef steak. Don't tell Gwyneth! I came upon this book because I'm researching for a podcast episode, the worst ways in history we've ever tried to cure ourselves. And there's some crazy stories of like drilling holes in our heads about weird rituals during childbirth. And so I came upon this book and I just had to share some of the crazy advice. This man from Minnesota faces murder charges after allegedly breaking into his aunt and uncle's house and killing his uncle. On the 24th of August, police got a harrowing 911 call. It stated that the person needed help as there was somebody inside their house. The terrified woman explained that her and her husband had been asleep in bed when an intruder had come in and started beating them with an object. 72 year old Pamela Novak had been beaten and pushed down the stairs when she managed to make the 911 call. She identified her nephew, 44 year old Adam Roaring as the attacker. Police obviously raced to the scene and they found Pamela and Mark with stab wounds and blunt force injuries. They saw a man fleeing the scene and promptly arrested him. He had a metal bar and part of another blood covered weapon. The couple was rushed to hospital, but tragically Mark passed away. Pamela remains hospitalized with extensive injuries. Adam's defense is that he had gone to his aunt and uncle's house in the middle of the night to return something and found an intruder there. I was found dead without organs on my first evening in Spain. The Spanish authorities ruled it a suicide to cover it up. My name is Loic Gudart, and this is the first part of my story. I was 19, full of life, and excited about going on vacation with my friends to Magaluf, a destination renowned for its fiestas. It was the first time I'd been on vacation without my parents, and I was ready to experience some unforgettable moments. But everything changed in an instant. On June 30th, 2018, I sent a text message to my parents to reassure them that I had arrived safely and that everything was fine. The next morning, they received a call telling them that I had died. According to the Spanish authorities, I had jumped from the seventh floor of a hotel that wasn't even mine. Suicide, they say. But there are several things wrong with this story. Firstly, I had no reason to end my life. I was happy. I had my whole life ahead of me. Secondly, a suspicious withdrawal of 150 euros had been made from my account a few hours before my death. Why withdraw money if I was going to kill myself? But most chilling of all, Della effects that will alter your perception of reality. Many iPhone users recall there being a robber emoji with a beanie, a black and white striped shirt, and a money bag thrown over his shoulder. However, this emoji never existed. In Star Wars Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back, Darth Vader does not say the words, Luke, I'm your father. He actually says this. No, I am your father. There was never a Disney intro where Tinkerbell dotted the I in Disney with her wand. Curious George does not have a tail. He never did. And Pikachu never had a black tip at the end of his. Rich Uncle Pennybags, better known as the Monopoly guy, never actually had a monocle. In fact, he didn't even have glasses. Contrary to popular belief, Mona Lisa always had a slight smile. 
I don't know about you guys, but I always remember jokes in kid shows about the fact that Mona Lisa wouldn't smile. The Berenstein Bears never existed. The cartoon bear family actually spelled their names the Berenstain Bears. The Flintstones has two T's. Flintstones. My father killed me for being gay when I was only 14. I was raised in Anderson, Nevada. Like numerous teens, I was on a journey to find where I fit in the world, trying to discern my true self. One fact stood out to me. I was gay. And while this shouldn't be an issue, for my father, it was intolerable. A heated disagreement about my sexuality erupted between us one day. Harsh words were exchanged, and emotions ran high. My father proclaimed, I'd rather not have a son than have a gay one. And he turned those chilling words into reality. In a fit of anger and prejudice, he took my life. He did this because he couldn't come to terms with my true identity. His animosity towards me outweighed his love. I was robbed of the opportunity to mature, to experience love, to truly live, all by the very person meant to keep me safe. I share my tale to highlight the harsh truth of homophobia and to illustrate the devastating impact of hatred. If you're going through this, I urge you not to let my narrative fade away. Stand against prejudice. Stand against homophobia. If my story moves you, please express your solidarity in a comment. Speak out against homophobia and prove that love triumphs over hate. Normal looking photos that have a disturbing backstory. While this photo looks like it's some prop from Halloween, it's an actual living two-headed dog that was created in 1959 by a mad Soviet scientist. He managed to create a two-headed dog that could smell, move, see, hear, and even bark. While this appears to be an ordinary doll, it belongs to a Russian scholar, Anatoly Moskvin, who was arrested in 2011 for having the mummified remains of young girls in his apartment. Police found 26 of these dolls in his home. This photo shows 23-year-old Tina Tintor hugging her dog, Max. One day, after taking Max for a walk, the two were driving home when they were killed in a fiery car crash by a drunk NFL player. This wooden head box is designed to prevent light, sound, or air from getting inside. In 1970, Colleen Stam was abducted by a serial killer and locked inside it for seven years. This image shows Marie Joseph taken the day she drowned while swimming in a public pool. However, her body wasn't found for 48 hours and during this time people would swim around the pool while she was decomposing at the bottom. This is TikToker Michelle Melody, and last year she tried to murder her boyfriend by stabbing him. So before her TikTok eventually got deleted after the crime, Michelle had almost a million followers here on TikTok. And she was known for posting fun little videos showing her day, her life. She always showed herself traveling the world and had just like a very nice, very nice life. So from the outside looking in, Michelle just seemed like your average influencer. But in September of 2022, some disturbing things would come out about Michelle. Now, around September of 2022, Michelle posted something on her TikTok. The message said, he asked me if I'm bad, I said I'm the worst. And shortly after she made this post, Michelle was arrested in Switzerland for stabbing her 19-year-old boyfriend, intending to kill him. Apparently, he was treated for multiple stab wounds and the incident happened inside of the couple's apartment. Shockingly though, he was able to leave the hospital the next day, so thankfully Michelle wasn't able to actually kill him. So I haven't been able to find any more about this case since it actually happened last year. I don't know if she ever went to trial or what eventually happened to Michelle, but I do feel like you should face some sort of consequences for stabbing your boyfriend multiple times with an object. But if we find out any more about this story, I'll be sure to update you guys. So you might have recognized the guy on the right side of that video as TikTok Mafia creator Clap Daddy. Now Clap Daddy was a big creator on this platform and he's been accused of doing some disturbing things. So Clap Daddy, whose real name is Colton, rose to fame before 2020 and that's really when all these allegations came out. And like you see with that first video that I included here, he was friends with some pretty big names here on the platform and a lot of people knew Clap Daddy. But they didn't know what he was like in the shadows. So this all started in 2020 when a creator, a fellow cosplayer named Ava Lee came forward 
and told her almost a million followers at the time that Clap Daddy had a clear history of fetishizing trans men and that he was known for saying sexual things to them. Then, after this creator posted this, another creator named Lucas, who was 16 at the time, came forward and said that Clap Daddy had been talking to them, messaging them all the time, even though they knew that they were only 16. And they said that Clap Daddy even offered to fly them out to a hotel room to spend a night together. Lucas also said that Clap Daddy made a list of the high schoolers' kinks and would frequently bring up this list in conversation. And after this was shared, a number of other trans minors came forward and said that Colton had been messaging them. He was trying really hard to get one of these trans kids to come sleep with him. And another person said that specifically, Colton had told them that he wanted to sleep with a trans person who wasn't out of the closet yet, even though he knew this person was underage, and that he had once again offered to get them a hotel room. But what did Clap Daddy do? Well, he posted a very damning rant to all of his social media, a seven-part rant, where he admits that yes, he talks to minors, he said that it was because he's in the cosplay community, and he claimed that he didn't flirt with minors, but then the same sentence, he admitted that he does compliment them, which obviously is a form of flirting. So there wasn't really any real end to the situation. Clap Daddy just faded away, thankfully. But yeah, it's just shocking to see so many of these creators that are bigger creators never get charged with, you know, talking to minors and grooming people and stuff like that when the everyday person definitely would be charged with something. 20 years ago, my life changed dramatically in a way I never could have anticipated. And it was all the result of something as simple as offering to water my best friend's flowers. My name's Kara Robinson Chamberlain, and 20 years ago, I was kidnapped from my friend's front yard by a man that was a total stranger, and I found out later, a serial killer. This is my story, one piece at a time, in my own words, and I'm telling it in this way to take ownership over it and to engage with you guys, give you the story, but also show you how much more there is to it and how much more you are, even if you've had bad things happen. So there are trigger warnings in this story. You have SA, you have kidnapping. So if at any point you're feeling triggered or you're feeling anxious, then please take a moment to take care of yourself and come back when and if it feels appropriate to you. Thank you so much for being here. What is some of the crazy stuff people have confessed to as they're dying? Well, in this series, I'm gonna to read to you some of the craziest ones I could find. This story comes from a hospice nurse that was dealing with a patient who had fought in the Vietnam War. Early on in his treatment, she actually asked him if he had any siblings, and he mentioned that he did have a brother, but he passed away in Vietnam. He also had a wife who had previously passed away, and because of this, he didn't have a lot of people that would come visit him. The man had dementia, and the nurse said that at times, it felt like he was digging deep into his brain to find moments from his life that he could describe to the nurse in vivid detail. So one night the nurse comes in and the man is in really rough shape. Like it looks like he's not gonna make it through the night. And when she walks in, he starts beckoning her over like, come here, come here, come here. So the nurse comes over and the man begins to tell her that his brother wasn't killed by an enemy soldier in Vietnam. He had actually killed his brother. And not only that, but these men were twins. So when the brother died, the other one fully assumed his identity when he came back to the States. Meaning that when he came back from the war, he took his brother's entire life, including his wife. The man ended up passing away that night, and later on the nurse told his daughter what she had heard. And the daughter did not believe her at all, but then years later, she finds a handwritten confession from her father stuffed in a Bible. One of the most successful serial killers in history is never talked about. Let's talk about Julia Tafana, who was said to have killed around 600 men. That is a lot of men. There is little known about Julia's life and upbringing. No pictures, nothing. This story takes place in the Renaissance period in Italy. Back then, women didn't really have any rights. Like, at all. They were usually forced into arranged, loveless marriages. In this time, when you got married, your husband owned you. Men had full ownership and control over their wives. Husbands would often beat their wives without any consequence. And unfortunately for the women, divorce was basically non-existent at the time. It wasn't even an option. So safe to say there was a lot of women stuck in abusive and loveless marriages with no way out. That's until Julia started her little business. Julia created an odorless, tasteless, and colorless, undetectable poison. And she put it in makeup products. 
She disguised her poison in beauty products that women could easily keep on their vanity and no one would question it. She called it Aquatafana. Pretty cool name. This product would allow women to discreetly kill their husbands over the span of four days. A few drops every day, and the initial symptoms would simply seem like a flu. A few more drops the next few days, and it would slowly weaken and eventually kill the men. You're probably wondering how she got away with killing all of these men without anybody noticing. Well, Julia was very careful. She didn't just sell Aquatafana to anyone. Any new client had to be verified by a past client and have a background check. Julia's clients were actually really protective over her as well and kept her secret. This went on for over 20 years. Julia would also coach the women on how to act around the days of the poison. After the first day when the husband starts getting the flu symptoms to act really concerned and call a doctor. The doctor would come and assume it was just a basic illness, give them medication and leave. The key was that the women were the ones to call the doctor. They had to act concerned, anxious. When the husbands would eventually die, the doctors would be baffled. And the key to all this was that the women were told to demand an autopsy. But the thing about Aqua Tefana is that it was undetectable in an autopsy, meaning that all of these deaths came back as natural causes. Unfortunately, the story is too long for one video, so come back for a part two to see what happens next. This is the woman people are calling the real life gone girl. She faked her own horrific abduction and wasted five years of police time. You're not gonna wanna miss this one. It is absolutely insane. This all begins November 2nd of 2016. Keith Papini returned home from work at around 5 p.m. He was expecting to come home to his 34 year old wife, Sherry Papini and his two kids, but they weren't home. Keith called the daycare where his kids were staying and asked when Sherry came to pick up the kids. The daycare then told him that she never came, so the kids were okay. He immediately finds this very strange, calls the police and reports her missing. This was taken very seriously by the police. She seemed to have vanished out of thin air. It wasn't long before the news was reporting on it and her missing posters were all over California. Because there were no leads, Fingers pointed at Keith, the husband. Everyone thought it was Keith. He even took a polygraph test and passed it, but people still thought it was him. That's until 22 days later, when Sherry returned. 150 miles away from where she was last seen, a driver finds her walking on the side of the road in chains. This driver called the police and she was brought in. She was covered in bruises. She had lost weight and her back had been branded. Understandably, police were shocked. When asked what happened, she claimed that two Hispanic women abducted her. She claimed that they were going to sell her to a man and that's why she was branded. Police were taking this very seriously. Sherry explained in detail the abuse that she went through and the room she was in. She also described the women enough for them to create a sketch of people who did not exist because it was all a lie. Police found it very strange that these abductors just let her go, but this isn't to say that they didn't believe her. They definitely did and they took it very seriously. They were determined to find out who did this to this poor mother of two. The government helped pay for therapy for her PTSD and anxiety after this event. During this time, police were testing her clothes and they finally found DNA. This DNA belonged to a man not a woman. And she apparently encountered no men during this kidnapping. They put it through the police database and nothing came up. That's until 2020 when they decided to put it through a genealogy database, hoping that someone related to the person with this DNA went on like ancestry or anything like that. With this, they were able to find the exact person with that DNA. And this person was Sherry's ex-boyfriend. The story only gets crazier from here, so come back for part two. It'll be up the moment I'm done filming. This is 20 month old baby Isaiah. Now do me a favor. Imagine for a moment that this is your daughter. 
Would you for any reason ever leave her home alone? I didn't think so. She, however, would. This is her 18-year-old mother, Verfi Cootie. I don't know if I'm saying her name right, and frankly, I do not care. Between the months of October and December of 2019, Verfi had left Isaiah home alone a handful of times, at least five times, with the longest period of time being two days. So two whole days, this baby is home alone to fend for herself. Now, on December 5th, 2019, Verfi decided, Verfi, I don't know, decided she wanted to go out and celebrate her 18th birthday. Even though baby Isaiah had been sick with the flu, Verfi had even canceled plans with the family because of Isaiah having the flu. I guess she was just like, I don't want to take her out because she's sick, da 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 which, okay, that's, that's you know, that makes sense. It, it probably would be best not to bring the baby out with the flu. Instead of asking someone to watch Isaiah, Verfi goes to celebrate her birthday with her boyfriend, leaving Isaiah in the apartment. Once again, she goes 50 miles to London, and there she lives it up. On the 7th, this is two days after leaving Isaiah in the apartment, she was seen at a concert and even asked the DJ to give her a shout out for her birthday. So it would not be until five, almost six days later that Verfi would return to the apartment. So this is when she initially left the apartment on December 5th, 2019, which was a Thursday at 5.40 p.m. This is her returning home on December 11th, 2019 which was a Wednesday, at 3.38 p.m. So all this time, Isaiah is just in the apartment by herself. When Verfi gets back into the apartment, she finds Isaiah unresponsive. And this is when she feels like it's a good idea to go on social media and tell her family members that Isaiah is just not doing well. At this time, Isaiah had already passed away. It would be two and a half hours before Verfi would finally contact emergency services. And that's when they come and take Isaiah to the hospital where she is pronounced deceased. So her cause of death was a combination of the flu as well as starvation. So just think about this. For exactly five days, 21 hours, and 58 minutes, this baby was by herself, sick with the flu, no food, no water, no milk, no one there to change her diapers, which resulted in a really bad diaper rash, obviously. I know of children that have sat in diapers for even hours at a time and have gotten really bad rashes. So you can just imagine how bad this baby had to suffer. <sighs> but it doesn't end there. And her mom is obviously arrested, rightfully so. She's a piece of trash. I'm sorry to say it. But in November of 2022, she pleads guilty to manslaughter and receives only nine years. Nine years in jail for leaving her daughter home while she's out dancing and having a good time. Nine years and this woman gets to live a free life while her baby doesn't get to live her life. I'm sure she will never have to suffer as much as this baby has had to suffer, but I hope that in jail... She feels just a little bit of that. I hope they don't treat her very well in there. And I definitely feel like she deserves more than nine years. This is a case of 19-year-old Alexi Treviso and how she went to the hospital complaining of back pain, but ended up getting charged with murder. Alexi Treviso was a 19-year-old senior in high school living in Artesia, New Mexico. She was on the varsity cheerleading team and she was dating her boyfriend, Devin, for about two years. Honestly, Alexi just seemed like a typical teenage girl prom was coming up soon her graduation was around the corner and she was already thinking about what university she was going to go to in the fall january 26 2023 that day was pretty much just like any other day for 19 year old alexi she went to cheerleading practice that day and got home in the afternoon she spent some time with her family and then she went to bed however she was woken up in the middle of the night with severe back pain this was like not normal back pain like alexi was in so much pain that her mother decided to take her to the hospital Alexi and her mother Rosa arrived at the Artesia General Hospital in the early morning hours of January 27th. 
Lexi checked in and told the doctors that she had really bad pain in her back, so they wanted to do a test to see if maybe she had a UTI or a kidney infection, since back pain can be a symptom of both of those things. So they're getting ready to do those tests, and then they asked Alexi, are you pregnant? Which is a very common thing to ask. I mean, if you're a girl and you've gone to the doctor before, I feel like they always ask you if you're pregnant. On top of that, experiencing back pain can be a symptom of pregnancy. So the doctor asked Alexi, are you pregnant? And she says no, that she's still a virgin and that she hasn't engaged in any sexual activity. So the doctor's like, okay, perfect. And they send Alexi over to go get a CAT scan done so that they can check for kidney stones. While she's getting that test done, the doctors decide to still do a pregnancy test just in case because you never know. So they did a urine test and when the results came back, they were positive. Alexi was pregnant. Now, of course, pregnancy tests can sometimes be inaccurate. So the doctors wanted to check her blood just to make sure that she was actually pregnant. Now, while all of this is going on, Alexi tells the doctors that she needs to go to the bathroom. Like she has to go number two and it's coming out like right now. So she gets up from the hospital bed and she literally runs to the bathroom holding her butt because she feels like it's going to come out. She locks herself inside the bathroom and she's in there for quite some time. Doctors and the staff at the hospital are getting kind of worried because she's been in there for a while and they know that she's pregnant. So they're thinking maybe she's having some type of miscarriage or something else is happening. They knock on the door, but Alexi refuses to come out. At one point, her mother Rosa also goes over to knock on the door, but Alexi says that she's just having trouble going number two and that she'll be out shortly. At this point, Alexi has been in the bathroom for more than like 20 minutes. So the doctors tell her, if you don't open the door right now, we're going to unlock it. Before the doctor can unlock the door, Alexi just opens up and starts walking back to her room. One of the doctors looks inside the bathroom just to see, you know, what happened. And they do see that there was all over the floor. They asked Alexi, what's going on? And she said that she simply got her period. Call over the cleaning lady to come clean up the bathroom. And when she starts to take out the trash, notices that the trash bag feels heavier than usual. So Leela, the housekeeper, goes to look inside the garbage bin, and when she pulls out a bag, she finds a baby. The baby was inside a clear plastic bag at the bottom of the bin. Okay, more in part two. This is the story of the Philpott family murders. On the 11th of May 2012, parents, 56-year-old Mick Philpott and 31-year-old mother, Mairead Philpott, set fire to their home, accidentally killing six of their beautiful children. Five of the children died at the scene, whilst the oldest child died three days later in hospital. Mick and Maraid set fire to their own family home as part of a vicious scheme to frame Mick's former partner and regain custody of his child. Mick reportedly had 17 children with five different women and several of his partners described him as abusive. Maraid was a 19-year-old single mother who had left a volatile relationship when she met Mick in 2000. By 2003, Mick and Maraid were married with Mick's mistress Lisa, with whom he had three children, acted as a bridesmaid. During the police investigation into the fire, petrol was found inside the letterbox of the house and a murder investigation was launched. Police booked the Philpott's hotel room and found evidence that they were responsible for starting the fire as was their friend, 46-year-old Paul Mosley. Further investigations found that the Philpott's clothes also had petrol on them. Initially, Mick's ex was arrested on suspicion of murder along with her brother-in-law, Ian Cousins, but both were released without any charge. Meanwhile, witnesses reported to the police that Philpott behaved strangely for someone who had recently lost several of his children and appeared to like the media attention. The police booked the Philpott's hotel room and gained evidence confirming the couple were responsible for the fire, including the involvement of friend Paul Mosley, with whom Maraid was heard engaging in a SEX act. Mick and Maraid were arrested on suspicion of murder on the 28th of May 2012. After seeking additional time for questioning, the couple were charged with murder on the 30th of May 2012. A discarded petrol container and glove had been found near the house, and in November, forensic investigators discovered that the clothes of the Philpots and Mosley had petrol on them. On the 5th of November, Mosley was arrested and charged with murder. This charge was later downgraded to manslaughter. During this tragedy, Many of the local residents from their area chipped in together to raise funds for the children's funerals. Mick even stooped as low as trying to gain 
access to the children's funeral money so that he could spend it on himself. He also suggested taking all the teddy bears and gifts left outside the house in remembrance of the children to take them on and sell them and keep the money for themselves. On the 12th of April 2013, Mick Philpott was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 15 years. Mairead and Paul received 17 years on which they would have to serve half before any release on licence. On November 29, 2013, an appeal by Mairead against the length of her sentence was heard. The grounds of the appeal were mainly that Mairead was under the control of her husband and could not exercise a free choice in her conduct. The appeal was dismissed. Mairead was released on licence in 2020 after serving half of her sentence. Paul Mosley was released from prison in May 2021 after serving half of his 17-year sentence. As of right now, Mick Philpott is still in prison.